Would you go with me to God in prayer before we begin? Father God, I'm so thankful, uh, Lord, just for the opportunity to come and to share. And Lord, as we uh, seek your word, I just ask that you would make yourself known. I, I don't believe to be um, qualified uh, to share your gospel message, Lord, but I believe what you've done on the cross makes it to where you will work in and through me. And so that's what I ask this morning, Lord, that you would empty me of me, that you would fill me with your spirit, to communicate your word of truth today. We love you, we praise you, in your holy name, amen. This morning we are continuing the series that we've been in called The Road to Discovery. When I was in high school at some point, my brother called me, his name's KC, which stands for Kenneth Caleb. He calls me up and says, hey, I'm going to go see this movie late tonight. It was like opening night. It's a really scary movie. I'm like, well, bro, I'd love to go, but I don't know if you forgot. I'm in high school, so I got to go to school tomorrow. So I can't exactly go to a midnight showing. Uh, so I, I, I couldn't go with him. And so I go to sleep that night, and I wake up the next morning to get ready for school, and there's an arm around me. And I'm like, this is interesting. <laughs> I look over, it's my brother. He had gone and seen the scary movie. <laughs> and he had come home and crawled in bed with me. <laughs> the greatest part about this story is that he didn't live at home anymore. <laughs> he had his own apartment. But the movie scared him so bad, he didn't want to be home alone in his own apartment, so he came home and slept with me. Isn't, isn't that one of our greatest fears, though? Loneliness? I think sometimes we pretend that we like it, maybe even for moments we do, and, and maybe those of us who are parents are thinking, oh, loneliness is great. I think it's silence and peace is what we really want, but... Uh, to, to be truly alone, I think is terrifying. I think for most of my, my life, I've carried the weight of my own spiritual journey. And, and by that, I mean I, I've tried to, to carry the, res, the responsibility of my, my own salvation. And, and I think that I, I labeled it and called it my personal walk with Jesus, my, my personal walk. But I think what I've discovered is that it's a pretty lonely road. It's funny how God works and, and his timing and how things happen and the fact that Steve would be gone this week and ask me to preach and ask me to preach on this topic because Lord knows I needed to hear it more than anybody else. And, and that's exactly where God has been teaching me lately. He's been trying to teach me his truth. He's been trying to help me get past some of the dysfunction that I've had in my own mindset. And he's been teaching me overall that this spiritual journey that I'm on is not just a walk for two. I want to read a couple scriptures with you. Luke 9, verses 18 and then verse 28 says this. One day Jesus left the crowds to pray alone. Only his disciples were with him. i am be honest with you this morning. I'm not good at math at all. Okay, so when I'm reading this scripture, I'm reading this and I'm thinking, okay, Jesus, I'm going to pray alone. Only his disciples are with him. I'm not good at counting, but I think there was 12 disciples. So 12 disciples plus Jesus doesn't make alone. I, I, that's what I'm reading here. Okay, then 10 verses later and eight days later, Jesus takes Peter, John, and James up to a mountain to pray. Man, we see here that, that Jesus spent a lot of time seeking God with other people, even intimate times like prayer. I've put so much pressure on myself to spend time with God and to make sure I do that daily, but whoever said that I needed to do that alone? Who says that we can't discover God's word together? And I'm not saying that our alone time is not an important thing. I think it's super important. 
But I think for the longest time, I separated the two. I separated my private time with God, and I separated my corporate time with other believers. But I think that God's purpose was for those things to be unified together. And I, and I love the model that Jesus gives us here, because there's time where he prays alone. There's time where he takes 12 disciples with him. There's times where he's praying with huge crowds. And there's time that he's praying with just an intimate three. Some of those that are closest to him. And you see here that, that Jesus developed a team and really what we're going to call this morning as the right crew. A group of carefully selected men and women to be his spiritual family, to help him carry out his mission here on earth. See, if Jesus was perfect, and, and I, I honestly find it hard to believe that he needed a team. I think he could have done it on his own, but it speaks volumes to how he feels about us, that he wanted to work with us, that he wanted to work in and through us. And I also believe that the way that he lived is an example for us to follow. And I think it's so important that we do the same, that we find the right crew. See, there's a reason that this message is entitled The Right Crew and not just The Crew. Because you and I both know that in life, there's definitely the wrong crew. This morning, I want to help you see why it's important that we have the right crew. How the right crew can aid and enhance us on our journey to this road of discovery. I believe that the right crew can help you change your failures. There's this really neat story in the Bible that I, that I love. It's about a prophet Nathan and King David. And now most of us, when we think of King David, there's probably two things that we think of. We think of Goliath and we think of Bathsheba. Now David is this king and he's, he's, he's on top of the world and he sees this woman and says, man, I have got to have her. She is gorgeous. The only problem is, is that she's married. But he's King David, so he does whatever he wants. So he has an affair with this woman, she becomes pregnant, and then he's got to kill the father. And that's what he does. And so now he's got this deep, dark, dwelling sin in his life. And then God comes to a prophet, he comes to Nathan. He says, uh, Nathan, I need you to go deal with David. I don't, know, I don't know if you guys are reading the same story I'm reading, but I'm thinking, if I'm Nathan, I'm thinking, Lord, can you send somebody else? Like, for real, you, you want me to go confront the one guy that can put me to death? And you want me to tell him that he's been an evil person? But Nathan, is, man, he just, he, he's really cool about this. This is part of that I love. He goes to him, he says, King David, can I tell you a story? Let me just tell you a story. He said, there's this, there's this thing where there's this guy, he's got this perfect little lamb. And that's the only lamb he's got. Then there's another guy that lives next to him, and he's got, like, sheep galore. He's got all kinds of sheep. He says, but that one guy, he saw that perfect little lamb and he wanted that lamb. And so he went out and he took that lamb and made it his own. And David, he's, getting, he's, he's hearing the story and he starts getting frustrated. He's getting upset. And this is what I want to pick up in the scripture, 2 Samuel 12, 5-7. It says, David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man of the one he stole for having no pity. And then Nathan said to David, You are that man. You are that man. I want you to do me a favor. If you're here this morning, and if you have ever made a mistake in your life, I want you to raise your hand. So, yeah, all of us. Now, I want to ask this again, but with a little, little bit of a difference. If you've made a mistake in life and you didn't know it until somebody showed you, yeah, it, it happens. Uh, I, I, I like to clarify my life as two different seasons. There's uh, BF and after BF, and that's before and after filter. Uh, because in my life, there was a lot of things that I, you know, when you're a young punk kid, you just say whatever's on your mind. Can I tell you, I offended people all the time and had no idea. Because I didn't, I didn't have a filter. Until somebody had to come and confront me and say, uh, I don't think that was a wise thing to say. Who knows? I might do it today. Uh, sermon's not over yet. 
But I, I honestly believe that, that we all need people in our lives that, that will gently and, and help us see our failures and help us to correct those things. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. I was with my brother in Kansas City, and we went to this little barn thing for the kids, and they had a blacksmith there. And I'm, I mean, I was just like so taken that people still do this. And like, I, I just, I sat there and watched him for way longer than I probably should have. And I'm sitting there, I'm that, I'm that annoying guy that's like asking all kinds of questions because I'm just like enamored with what's going on. And I'm like, please tell me more, tell me more. So I don't know if he was annoyed by me or if he was like, oh, I'd love to talk to you. Uh, but he's telling me, and I'm like, man, a lot of this stuff looks like iron. Is, is that what metal you work with? He says, actually, he said, we kind of make it look like we're working with iron. But he says, most of us that still blacksmith today, we don't work with iron anymore. And I'm like, oh, really? So you know me. The next question, why? Why don't you work with iron? He says, actually, he said, we, he said iron is just kind of a pain. He said, it's, it's really hard on the outside, but he said, it's, it's very brittle on the inside. So if you don't know what you're doing, it's, it's easy to make mistakes. It's, it's easy to ruin what you're doing. And I thought, oh my gosh, the scripture came to life to me in a different way I never even understood before. As iron sharpens iron, because you guys know we need to be corrected gently because we are very hard on the outside, but we are also very brittle on the inside. And you guys know it just as well as I do that there's people in your life that you hear well from and there's people in your life that you don't hear well from. When my brother said, hey man, you did this, you did this, I don't want to hear him. I, I get defensive and I'm like, eh, I don't tell that. But then there's people in my life that I love and respect that they can come in and gently say, hey, you know what, Will? I don't know that you meant to do this, but you did it. And it's not okay. And you need to change. These people in our life give us the opportunity for reconciliation, opportunity to make amends, opportunity to be different, to see the, the error in our ways and to change. These people that, that are the right crew, they, they walk along our side lovingly through those dark moments in our life. When we, when we screw up, when we make mistakes, when we, we don't get it right, they love us through those moments. Honestly, one of the reasons I, I knew that I, I needed to marry Stephanie was because she made me want to be a better person. Uh, the more time I spent around her, uh, when I'm with her, I, I, I wanted to be the man that was worthy of marrying her. That's, that's who I wanted to be. I, those, those, are, those are the kinds of people we need in our lives. People that call us to be better. The right crew will love you through your mess, but they'll call you to be better. They'll give you a chance to change your failures. Another thing the right crew does is they encourage you to be yourself. When I was in Pennsylvania, I got an opportunity to, to help out and be an assistant coach for the high school girls varsity team. And when I'm, you know, you go through like this interview process where you meet with the coach and you meet with the administrators and you do all this. And like, I, I felt such pressure to like, make sure that I had like all of this like basketball knowledge, like they were hiring the greatest assistant coach in the world. And I was just going to blow their minds and I was going to help these girls become the best basketball players ever. And I knew all this information about plays. But honestly, I didn't know much at all. I, I really didn't. I pretended to know like I knew a lot. But I, I mean, I was around basketball a lot as a kid. So I, I knew fundamentals and knew some certain things. But I'd never played organized basketball. I didn't really know a whole lot. I didn't know about the drills and the plays and all this. And it's so funny, I, all that time trying to pretend to be something I'm, I, I wasn't really. And it was all a waste of time. And in hindsight, that's not what these girls needed me to be. These girls needed really an emotional coach. They needed a coach that when they sat on the bench, they didn't get yelled at for every single thing they did wrong. They needed a coach that, that helped them have fun. They needed a coach that helped them get out of their heads and, and just enjoy the game of basketball. That's what they needed me to be. But, but isn't that what we do in our lives with, with a lot of the stuff that we do? We pretend to be what we think other people need us to be? And how often do we do that at the expense of what people really need? There's a verse I want to share with you, Proverbs 29, 25. 
says, fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting in the Lord means safety. And I think, man, a lot of times that you read this verse and you think, man, I shouldn't be afraid of any man or any woman or, or whatever. And, and I think of like maybe somebody attacking me or, or you know, whatever that is. But I, I don't think that's what Solomon's trying to tell us here. I think he's trying to say, be comfortable with being who you are and knowing what you know, that God created you for a purpose. And that's what he wants you to do. Don't, don't be afraid of what other people think about you. It doesn't matter what they think. It matters what God thinks. Trust in the Lord. And when you trust in him, that's, that's safety. When you get around the right crew and the right people, they create a culture where you are free to be yourself, to be real and to be vulnerable with other people. You want to know why we're dealing with some of the highest depression rates? I believe it's because we're not being real. I believe it's because we're not being vulnerable with anybody. We can be surrounded by as many people as we want to be surrounded by, but if we're not being ourselves, we feel alone because we're hiding our real self. We feel lonely because we don't have the opportunity to be real, to be the people that God created us to be, quirks and all. I want to read something from Matthew 3, verse 4. And this is about John the Baptist. And just kind of, this guy was a nut. Okay, look at this. John's clothes were woven from coarse camel hair. First word comes to my head, itchy. That doesn't sound fun. Obviously, not people, they didn't wear camel hair. Okay, he wore a leather belt around his waist, so he got something right. And for food, he ate locusts and wild honey. So I know this doesn't seem that crazy. First of all, grasshoppers. I don't know if you tried to eat a grasshopper before or a locust. It can't be good, man. It just can't. Wild honey. You know what wild honey means? That means you had to rip it out of a beehive. That's how wild it was. <laughs> you got to be some kind of crazy to be reaching your hand into a honeybee nest to get some honey. Okay? This dude was crazy. Okay? He lived in the wilderness most of the time. But check this out. This is, this is what's said about him as he's born. Luke 1. And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins because of God's tender mercy. And the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give us light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. Man, John might have been a weird guy, but he prepared the way for the Savior of the world. And I don't believe that he could have done that pretending to be somebody that he wasn't, pretending to be maybe who the religious leader said he was supposed to be and how to dress and how to act and what to do. He was himself. And I honestly believe that the worst thing that we can do in our lives is suppress who we really are because we're afraid of what people might think or do. And I think the biggest tragedy is that when we do that, we miss out on doing what God created for us, suppressing the gifts and talents that he's given us just because other people don't think they're gifts and talents. The right crew loves the real you, the real you, and helps you become who you were created to be the right crew, I believe, encourages you to be you. And that's where we find happiness. The right crew also motivates us to action. My middle brother, John, is, is one of my favorite people in the world simply because he has the greatest gift to be able to find things that are happening and take people with him. I went on vacation to Kansas City to see my brother. Okay, and I'm there, it's like the second night, and my brother looks at me, and he's like, yo. He's like, let's go. Go where? Just me and you? What's happening? He says, get in the car, we're going to go down to the soup kitchen, and we're going to serve supper tonight for some of the homeless people. And I'm like, I'm on vacation, homie. I'm not, I'm not trying to serve homeless people, I'm trying to serve myself. That's what vacation's about. He says, come on, go with me. Well, another time I went and visited him, same thing happens. I'm sitting on the couch enjoying my life. 
And he's like, come on, man, let's go. Where are we going? He says, we're going to go down to one of these foster homes and we're going to play kickball with some of those kids. And I'm like, dude, I work for a living with students. <laughs> I'm on vacation. I don't want to hang out with kids. But man, that, that's, that's what he... He just has this ability to, to, to find places to, to serve and to take people with him. I, I think my brother's a perfect example of what the right crew does for you. They motivate you to action. They, they help find and facilitate opportunities for you to serve. Do you have people like that in your life? Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. I just want to point out a couple things in this scripture. One, I love the word encourage. I mean, it literally means to give someone courage. Like, I know that you can't physically hand courage to stuff, but that's, that's what he's talking about. When you give someone courage, give them hope, give them confidence. The right crew motivates you, they believe in you, they see your value, and they help you do the things that God created you to do. But I believe that it's really difficult to know that if you don't ever spend time around the right crew, around the right, pre right people. I know that there are, maybe there's some of us in here that we just don't have these people in our life. I believe that most of us have at least one or two of these people in our lives. Maybe we don't even know about it. Uh, and, and truthfully, some of us can be these people for others. But, but this is something that takes time. And the question is, are we taking the time? Look, in Scripture, it says right here, take time to think. When's the last time you were going to go meet somebody for dinner or go hang out with a friend? When's the last time you thought to yourself before you got in your car, how can I think about motivating this person? What, what can I do before I even see them? Is there something I can do to motivate them, to encourage them, to uplift them, to love them? When's the last time we did that? It takes time. And then it says right here in Scripture, don't, no, don't neglect meeting together like others have done. It takes time to meet. And I don't mean just like we do here at church, but I, I think it's so much more than that. I want to share with you a Scripture from Acts 2. And I want you to understand before I share this, that this is not me throwing guilt on you. This, I believe, is just a glimpse of what life can be like for us. Acts 2, 42 through 46. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the sharing and meals and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over them and the apostles performed many miraculous things signs and wonders and all the believers met together in one place and they shared everything they had they sold their property their possessions and shared the money with those in need they worshiped together at the temple every day met in homes for the lord's supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity this acts church man and they, they lived together they they died together they, they, they met every day they were willing to give anything they had they motivated each other, encouraged each other, they loved each other, they gave each other their time. And I realize that maybe this is an unrealistic goal for our culture, but I believe with all my heart there's things in here that we can learn to change. Because I think that there's people in our circle that need more time with us, and I think there's people in our circle that we need more time with them those people that we need to encourage and the people that can encourage us. The right crew will help motivate you to action. I'm going to give you one more. I believe the right crew will help you thrive in any circumstance. I have a short little video clip that I want to show you from a football game that I think is, is just a beautiful explanation of exactly what I mean, and don't miss it, it's quick. Turn your attention to the screen.
I'm not sure if you saw what I saw. Let me tell you what I saw. We have a running back that's about to get stuffed. He's about to get thrown into the ground, and it's about to be third down. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes this O-lineman, and he literally grabs the running back, picks him up, and carries him into the end zone. And he scores the touchdown. Man, that's what life is like, isn't it? Sometimes it just seems like life, no matter how hard you try, man, you, there's just, you get to this point and you feel stuck and you just can't break through and there's just nothing you can do. See, I believe that when we tap into the right crew, the right crew, when you get stuck, they pick you up and they carry you past. The right crew helps you thrive even when life isn't good. Sometimes you need the right crew to simply just pick you up and carry you. I want to read to you Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. Two people are better off than one, for they can help carry each other and succeed. One person falls, the other can reach out and help, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people are lying close together. They can keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. And three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not as easily broken. I'll read that to you again, just a part. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. I don't know about you, but in life, that's, we're attacked all the time. Whether it's our marriage, our finances, children, health, Job, bad stuff happens all the time. To the good people, to the bad people, life is just difficult. But when you have the right crew, this is what it's saying, when you have the right crew, you can stand back to back and conquer. Man, how many times have we been going through difficulties in our life, whether it be our marriage or whatever it is, and we're trying to push through alone? And we don't tell anybody. We keep it to ourselves. We don't let anybody in. We just try to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. But the truth of the matter is we can't do it alone. We need somebody to pick us up and carry us through. The right people help you find joy. They comfort you. They love you. They remind you of God's promises, and they stand in the gap for you. When you have the right crew, you can thrive no matter what comes your way. Why? Because you put Jesus at the center. There's two verses. I want to I point out something really cool for you. Two verses I want to talk about for a second. One, it's a verse that says, um, man, mine just went blank. Don't you love when that happens? When two or more gather in my name, I am there also. And two can stand back to back and conquer. I want you to think about this for a second. You know why that is? You know why we can stand back to back and conquer? You got yourself. And then when you have the right crew, you got two. What does Scripture say? Scripture says, when two or more are gathered in my name, I am there also. It says two can stand back to back and conquer. In fact, a cord of three strands is not as easily broken. We can stand back to back and conquer when we put Jesus Christ at the center. That's what the right crew does for you. They help carry you to the presence of Jesus Christ, and he's the one that conquers. I don't know about you, but I, I, I love playing hide-and-seek. It's one of my favorite games, and if you ask this section right here, they will tell you why I love to play hide-and-seek. I don't really like to play the game. What I like to do is I like to hide, and then I like to jump out and scare the living mess out of people. Okay? I don't know why I love scaring people. I just do. And it's great because people are like, oh, you scared me? I'm going to get you back. Well, I love being scared too. <laughs> so it's like, it's, it's like the best because then they think they're going to get me back, and then I, it's just fun for me. It's a win-win. 
Man, it's funny to me, when you think of a game like hide and seek, everybody wants to hide, but nobody wants to be it. In fact, we've created games before the game to figure out who's going to be it. I mean, literally, I mean, how many times have you been at the prayer table and somebody's done this? Or they've done something like, I don't want to pray, somebody else going to pray. I mean, we, we've literally invented games so that we don't have to be it. We love, I, I think it's the same thing here. We love having the right people around us. We love having the right crew. We want the right crew in our lives. But the question for you today is, are you being the right crew for others? Are you taking the opportunity to be it? To be it for other people? Are we helping others change their failures? Are we encouraging others to be themselves? Are we finding out that we're motivating other people to action? Are we helping them thrive even in worse, difficult circumstances? You know, there's a, a really cool version of hide-and-seek that I love to play. And basically, the rule is, is when you find somebody, they become it with you. And so the game really doesn't end until everybody's on the same team and everybody's it, the game's over. I think that's how we need to start playing. I think that's how we need to play the game. We need to find the right crew, and we need to seek and save the lost until there's nobody else. We're not supposed to do any of that on our own. We're all supposed to do it together. Life is not meant to be a solo sport. It's a team sport. We're supposed to be here for each other, lean on each other. And I believe that there's ways that we can do that. And I believe there's ways that we need that. Let me pray for us this morning. Father God, I, I'm so thankful for your word. Lord, even as I've preached this morning, I'm saying stuff and I'm thinking to myself, Lord knows I need to do that. Father God, it is so easy for me to isolate myself and, and just to, to, to take everything on as a challenge, a challenge that I can face and overcome. The truth of the matter is, Lord, I, I need people in my life. We all need people in our lives that are willing to be the right crew for us that are willing to, to call us out and to love us through our dark times. People that are in love with who we are, that encourage us to, to be us, even when it's not popular. People that motivate us to action, help us uh, find opportunities to serve and to love others. And Father God, people that, that stand with us and carry us when we simply can't stand anymore. And I believe that, that we're called to do that for people as much as possible as well. And so, Lord, I, I, I stand here today and I, I ask for strength and courage. Lord, I, I don't believe this to be a message where we come to the altar in prayer, or not that that's not an, an amazing thing, or not, not that that's not needed by somebody, but for me, Father God, I, man, I, I pray that you help me to think about this all day long. I pray you help me to think about this all week long. Ways that I can change and impact not only my life, but ways I can change and impact others simply because I'm giving of my time and my life and myself. Lord, to band together as you meant us to, as your body of Christ. Different people doing different things, working together to save the lost. Lord, I just pray for strength and courage as we leave this place. Help us to think about how we can change and how we can be different and how we can be the right crew for others. We love you. We praise you. In your holy name, amen. So thankful that you have given of your time to be here today. Uh, it's an honor to get an opportunity to serve you. Um, we just ask that if you are near or nearly new, 
new or nearly new? I can't tell. I don't know what I'm saying. Somebody else want to do announcements? Uh, I would love, I'll be at the Welcome Center. I would love to get a chance to meet you. Uh, don't forget, we're selling Show the Love tickets uh, through the doors and down by the hallway. And then there's a young adult luncheon here. Lots of stuff going on. I love and appreciate you. Have a wonderful week. You are dismissed.